So, I mean, really, um, tonight's kind of proposition is very much about experience and culture in the digital age. And we talked about it being somewhere or everywhere. And um, it's about experiencing physical, remote, augmented cultural community experiences. And I guess, um, I guess this whole kind of topic for Adrian and I started, um, gosh, about a year and a half ago. We, um, we were talking one night over dinner about how the work that we were doing, um, we were doing jobs that really didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago and being quite excited about being at the front end of something and how, I guess, um, our respective areas have progressed quite a bit over the last 10 or 15 years. So for Adrian, that's around the whole user experience and surf design space, and for me, um, in uh, sustainability, particularly corporate sustainability, but also coming from a background around urban design. And so we got talking more about you know, how it was quite exciting to be in that space, and, um, and then we started to talk a bit about how what would happen if our two areas started to converge? What if um, we started thinking about urban design and place and what that would mean if you started thinking about digital, online and, uh, and service design? And that led to quite a long discussion which then led to us actually deciding that we were going to do a presentation together at a conference last year which was quite fun and it was quite good because it actually forced us to really think hard about this whole area and um, many, some of you um, who are here tonight um, saw us give that talk. And it was pretty much a literature review of some of our um, favourite books. And um, some of the, the books and some of the writers and, and designers that we talked about were people like William White, um, who talks about the social life of small urban spaces, which is essentially um, a study of spaces in New York. And there's a, a gorgeous movie that he made of people using public space um, around New York. Um, we talked about Christopher Alexander, a, pit, a pattern language, and I think that also relates really beautifully to design thinking um, and service design as well. Ideas or a, a kind of collection of ideas of how you make great places. And of course, um, Jan Gell, the space between buildings and social life of cities, and some of you might know that Deb Deering, who's here tonight, actually studied um, with Jan Gell when she did her PhD um, in urban design. And we also talked about Bill Mitchell. Um, <laughs> Um, and we also talked about Bill Mitchell, um, an Australian academic over at MIT who wrote a book called City of Bits. And so people, he, he was actually someone who was starting to talk about this interrelationship between digital and place. And Adrian spoke about service design and um, a particular fellow called Adam Greenfield, who's a real sort of pioneer in urban informatics, who wrote a book called Everywhere. And Ezio Manzini, who looks at the interrelationship between service design and sustainability. So I guess that got me thinking, and many of you all know that I recently left um, um, a role where I've been working in an organisation for about nine years. And it's not often that you get a point in your life where you actually get to take a bit of a pause. And so for me, I've been thinking, well, wouldn't it be really good to actually go overseas and actually go and um, experience some places, but also go and meet some people that I've always wanted to go and meet. And so I'm beginning to build up an itinerary of places that I'd like to go and see and people I'd like to go and talk to in September. So this is very impromptu because I didn't realise I was going to have to give a talk this afternoon, but here's a collection of um, <laughs> some of the ideas that I've been having around the places and the people I'd like to go and talk to in September. And what my plan is is to come back in a couple of months towards the end of the year and actually tell you about some of those places and some of those people that I got to speak to, if I get to meet them, if I'm fortunate enough. So here goes. So many of you will know that I'm obsessed with cities. And um, so 2% of the Earth's surface, half the world's population now, 75% of um, the energy consumption um, and 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. So they're an exciting place. They're more than half the world's population now lives in them, but they've also got some of the challenges around sustainability. So also from an urban informatics perspective, cities are now talking to us like they never have. That, you know, we are now able to use devices, there's information that cities are now relaying back to us. I guess I want to go and talk to the people who are really tuning into that information that cities are putting out. So I guess I want to really understand how cities become truly low carbon, livable and productive um, for future generations. So the first place I want to go to is a really interesting place in the sense that it's a, it's a greenfield city called um, Songdo in Korea. Now, I expect I'm going to be really underwhelmed by this place. Um, <laughs> but I figure I've got to go there and really understand it. So it's a smart city that's built from scratch. Um, and Cisco and a couple of developers have been pouring a lot of money into this place. It's just near the airport um, uh, in uh, Seoul. 
And uh, there's a huge focus on sustainability, They're using all the sustainability tools under the sun, including um, what we call Green Start Communities, the equivalent um, lead MD from the US. And there's a huge focus on smart grids and low traffic congestion and telepresence for security and education. But my sense is that they haven't actually thought about the people. And, um, and certainly they haven't thought about the urban design. So my sense is that there's some real problems with this place. But I'd like to understand why did they not actually address those elements? Why did those pieces get forgotten? Why is it that the corporations who are building this place kind of neglected to focus on those areas? So I'm quite curious to kind of learn about why this place isn't working. Um, of course, Singapore. And, um, and Singapore, it's the focus here, um, from what I've read anyway, is, is around efficiency and productivity. And um, a lot of work that's being done by MIT around um, uh, really understanding pollution and um, eco-efficiency and, and transportation. But again, there doesn't seem to be a real focus around the people piece here either. Again, I'm kind of curious to understand why, why is that the case? But then a place that is really thinking about people is, um, is in Helsinki. There seems to be a stack of work um, going on here at the moment, and Michelle will certainly know that um, her old boss, um, Dan Hill, is someone who's right at the forefront of, of a lot of the activity that's happening there from a design leadership perspective and design thinking and the work that's been done around an, a, um, a project called Low to Know, which is a residential project which is incredibly well focused around um, low carbon, but using a lot of these informatics tools to actually support that but not just from a carbon perspective, but also in terms of creating a sense of community. Um, and I think it's quite extraordinary that Finland's sovereign wealth fund um, is called Citra, and the fact that they're actually investing in design, and design thinking, I think really tells you where a country like Finland is at. So I'm really, um, I'm really looking forward to trying to understand why that's happening and why there's such a huge focus and a government focus on design thinking in terms of getting that right, because I think Australia could really benefit from that kind of thinking as well. Um, and there's lots of also really cool things happening from an urban informatics perspective as well in Finland. And on to London, where there seems to be a huge focus around open access data. Um, so you've got the datagov.uk work that's going on. But of course, you know, the, the way in which that kind of gets played out in the physical realm is um, the Boris bikes. And the fact that um, everyone, of course, is riding around on the Boris bikes. But the really cool bit is all the data around where the Boris bikes are going is completely um, available to anyone to play with that information, manipulate it, map it, understand where are people going, what times of the day, how are they using the city, and what is it that an urban designer or a planner can use to actually better understand and better shape the city and respond to that live information that people are actually creating as they move around the city. So I think that's, that's interesting. But also, IBM Smart Cities have got a huge focus in London as well, and I kind of worry about what happens when corporations start playing with this data? Are we going to see some of that access to data get closed down? When, you know, what's quite exciting around you know, the thing like with the Boris bikes and government trying to open up that information, and what's that tension between open data and closed, and that data being closed down? And then the side, um, another group that I want to go and um, meet with is uh, called the Young Foundation, and some of you here tonight would have been at um, a talk last week. Um, where a guy called Chris Vanstone spoke um, from the Australian Centre for Social, um, uh, Social Innovation. And uh, Taxi was built on, on the basis of an organisation called the Young Foundation, which again is um, using the principles of service design to address social impact. And, um, and I think there's something quite special that's happening there. Also an organisation here in Sydney called the Centre for Social Impact is really trying to learn the lessons from the Young Foundation as well. And I guess when I talk about sustainability, I don't just mean um, low carbon or um, water or waste. I also, you know, for me, it's what's really important is around the cultural dimension and the social dimension and, and how do we actually create a great society, not only now, but well into the future. Um, then on to New York. Um, and I guess what I'm interested here is around some of the citizen-led democracy um, activities that are going on. So everyone's heard about the High Line. The High Line is um, a disused railway line, above ground railway line, where citizens basically claimed that space back and turned it into a park. And I think there's a whole bunch of things going on from that sort of citizen perspective in New York at the moment. And the fact that you have a chief digital officer as well, really um, trying to tap into what citizens want and using online tools to do that is also quite exciting. Uh, then on to Boston, which is, I think, in my sense, the home of the most innovative um, city listeners with the MIT Sensible Lab. Um, and I know Michelle and I have been talking about, wouldn't it be great to get Carlo Radi out to Australia next year for Green Cities? We'll see if we can. Um, 
but I think some of the work that they've been doing really, and I know um, Rachel, um, I think Rachel. Uh, that there, Rachel, I've also talked to um, about um, some of the exciting things that have been going on um, at MIT as well. And they've been undertaking projects globally. And um, I guess, well, this is an example. This is the Copenhagen wheel. Um, so this bike here, um, the red disc that's attached to that bike can actually be attached to any bike. And uh, what it does is that it um, collects the energy when you brake on the bike. And basically you can use that to power the bike when you're going up a hill. But also that red disc also interacts with your phone. Um, it can tell you about the pollution in the environment that you're in. It can help you map. Um, it can help collect all sorts of data. Um, around the, the place in which you're in, give you traffic information as well. So it's an idea about how you kind of can link the analogue with the digital and create um, a more enhanced um, city experience. And then finally, and I'm not sure if I'll get to this place, kind of this is a bit more of a pipe dream, but um, to get down to um, Curitiba in Brazil. Because in a sense, a lot of this thinking about smart cities was born out of what um, happened in um, Curitiba quite some time ago, in, um, in that it's kind of more of an analogue city um, but it's probably the first city that really focused on addressing congestion from a really deeply well-planned um, transportation system and a truly um, well-integrated bus network that was done at low cost but actually really works. And, um, and I think a lot of what we're trying to achieve is some really good lessons that can be learned from that analogue experience um, in Brazil. So just to wrap, um, I guess what I'm hoping to build up from this whole experience is a bit of a pattern book, you know, a la Christopher Alexander. Of course, it won't be as good as his, but but a whole collection of ideas around case studies and principles and pathways um, to kind of share with um, fellow city um, and community builders and really explore some of these issues around environmental and social sustainability and kind of, I guess, refresh my thinking around what's possible um, into the future and kind of come back to the discussion that Adrian and I were having um, 18 months ago and actually how do we push that forward. So I guess that's just a bit of a kind of, kind of where my head's at right now um, and some of the sort of thinking I've been doing over the last couple of weeks. So, any questions? But um, I guess um, uh, there's also opportunity for questions later on as well. Well, I think if anyone has a question now, it would be it'd be great to um, to hear. It would be like, who? What cities would we add to that? Is there a city that? You know, is anywhere in India. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I used to live in India, um, and I was actually talking to someone today um, who um, is from India, and she was saying, because I lived there 15 years ago, and she said you wouldn't recognise the cities now. In 15 years, that it's changed so fast. So it's a good question, it's a good thing to reflect on, because I kind of, because I thought, oh, India, you know, I know India, but she said, no, you actually wouldn't know that India today, it's changed that fast, which is quite extraordinary. You're going for a Churchill Fellowship? Um, that's certainly being explored, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Need some supporting yeah. letters. <laughs> Can I ask a question as to how long? Because I've got to say, each of those cities have got some fantastic things mm. to explore. Mm. And you could easily spend a month in each place. You could. No, no, I, no so I'm, I'm not planning to, to spend months, so no, I don't have the budget to do that. <laughs> oh, I certainly have a few ideas for that too. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess I might go to all those places, but they're the kind of the places I've been thinking about. I've really got to kind of choose, the, I guess, sort of four and, um, and really lock into those and make sure that it's really yeah. worthwhile. So, so what are you Joe. thinking there for about the method? The method? Um, you know, I probably, I'm not <coughs> there yet on the method, but I think I've really got to come up with a template around, um, I guess, the, the kind of the core question I need to ask myself in each place. And, um, and I guess the answers... Um, and the patterns I kind of want to explore um, to pull out and make it kind of something worthwhile. I heard a bit more of a comment. Lucky and I did um, very similar itinerary, say, um, Brazil. You yep. didn't go to Brazil. You went to Chile, right? You went to Chile. Um, but I think what you'll find is, is, with regards to a method, is that there's very different drivers. In a place mm. like the US, for example, um, you know, it's not a place that has a huge history of investing a lot in public service and therefore their expectations mm -hmm. are quite low. So therefore the appetite or the willingness to self-organize and unite, you know, <laughs> is actually quite high. Uh, whereas in a place like Helsinki, it, it markets itself really well as super innovative, but when you end up talking them down, when you yep. get there, um, you know, it's, it's a country that on the whole works really well. And mm. so the appetite for innovation is actually quite low. low. <laughs> so, no, but it's, it's really interesting because you'll find that the cultural differences, and it couldn't be more related mm. to what we're talking about tonight. So that's a really good point to kind of actually understand, truly understand the cultural um, context of how these, um, these uh, 
these elements kind of play out. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a really important point. You'll enjoy it. And I think something also is um, actually the different kinds of governance and even just on some of the conversations I've been having with people in Australia is that our cities in Australia actually govern quite differently to cities in, say, the US where a yeah, city, um, so I'm looking at Ben because Ben works for the Sydney City Council, um, <laughs> Cities in the US, you know, they have um, remit around police and um, uh, um, education and, uh, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different dimensions that in Australia, it's, our council's much smaller. Sorry, Rachel. Well, there's a big um, historical and, and political context mm. to that. And in the United States, for example, um, the way that education is funded, for example, is local. Yeah. Mm. In fact, the way that mm. most mm. things are funded through local taxes. Mm. So the whole dynamic of and this comes back to the politics and the culture, is that the way things move is completely different in the United States than it is, say, for example, the closest analogue in Australia would be Brisbane, because yeah. it's the only big metropolitan district yeah. we have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but coming back to that, I was really interested in a career example, because there's also the dimension of history mm. in all of these places. And looking at the example that you mentioned in... in, in, uh, in, yeah. in so Sindo, is that, um, and I've done a lot of work in Singapore mm. recently, the last couple of years, for example, um, these countries look at themselves as being uh, on the verge of the new. Right. Because right? because the development is relatively mm. recent. And the cultural, the, the whole framework of, of culture around what is new and interesting is built essentially on 25 years. Mm. Um, and, and if you approach it from a Western context, where we have very different notions of what is is historic in architecture, for example, just in terms of design, is, is completely different. They don't have, uh, this is not in any way a pejorative, mm. I actually think it's actually a positive. Mm. Um, they have a completely different framework to start from. So you're looking at Songdu, for example, and it, for me it looks like very much like a Corbusier kind of city of, yeah. of, you know, like, and you're saying, how did they get this wrong? It's like, well, actually, they're not coming from the same place. Mm. Mm. So I think that's a really... It's always like the discussions we've had around Shanghai and yeah. the two sides of the river. Yeah. and um, They're not coming from the same way mm, of thinking. So you can mm. look at it from a Western architecture point of view and say, um, well, we've got this and this and this and this and this and, this and we, we come from this. They don't come from that perspective. Mm. They're coming from a completely different perspective. So how does that manage? I shouldn't even say they because mm. it's actually we. Mm. Yes. Um, but the, but the, the, the way of thinking is... is, is Modernism didn't happen. Mm. <laughs> yeah. mm. Max or oh, uh, Tina? I was just going to say, how does that you know manifest in terms of you know the Siobhan saying it hasn't worked? And, but it well, worked. I don't know that it hasn't worked. worked but it doesn't yeah. feel like it's 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 it feels like the people have done missing. much about yeah. the people. So well, the Singapore government would say that they're really interested in efficiency, and that's that's the like outcome they want. Like any government. You pass the word through. What does efficiency mean for whom? Mm. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean efficiency for the people. It means efficiency for certain outcomes. Max, I just. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder if you could establish a baseline um, from visiting a city in Australia or mm. even New Zealand um, to then use as your you know, your control. Mm. What do others think? Which city would you Perth. Perth. <laughs> <laughs> They're crazy over there. <laughs> I'd almost say New York should be your control in many ways. Yeah. Because New York, in ter especially when you consider cultural histories and those sorts of things, you know, we talked about how how in New York it's citizens uniting for a cause, but it wasn't always like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jane Jacobs and Greenwich Village mm -hmm. and the High Line, is, they are very similar to one another, yeah. but at the exact same time, you still have Harlem and Robert Moses and, and everything right. that, that occurred. And in so many ways, the history of the city embodies I agree. Both, both sides. I think that's a, it's a real, that's a really interesting way to look at it because you have that, that, you know, that tension between Moses and, and Jacobs. And people still talk about that, and people still take sides. You know, no one agrees that one was right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are there are two great books to my mind about cities, both yeah. called Maximum City, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and one of them is about New York, and one of them about Mumbai. Mm. Um, mm. Interesting. And they mm. both have completely different approaches. The one about New York is about the, the history of the underside of New York. Mm. So all of the things that were corrupt, or wrong, or broken by by a guy called Michael Pye. And, um, 
and how New York kind of thrived in spite of the governance of New York. And of course, Maximum City, which is the more recent book about Mumbai, is also about exactly the same thing, mm. um, but in completely different ways, which is that cities thrive in spite of mm. the plans that are put around them. Mm. 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 Interesting. Users will do, There's a mm. people who use the community will do what they do mm. regardless of what people tell them. There's obviously a filter mm. to that though. There is. That's it. I think the filters yeah. are the most interesting piece because yeah. what is what is the like what yeah. what is the thing that that makes Mumbai works for certain values of work, mm. but but yeah, I think you're right. It's it's like what is the filter between what is planned and what is actually the actual experience.